In the mid-city neighborhood of New Orleans, there's a little street named Hagen Avenue, lined with tidy houses and a neighborhood sandwich shop. Wide enough for one lane of traffic and just a few blocks long, it seems a bit humble to have a grand title like Avenue, but Hagen used to be a lot bigger. Continuing past its current end at Lafitte Avenue to the Girt Town neighborhood, In 1904, when there were just 50 cars in the city, the Automobile Club proposed Hagen, with its broad grassy median or neutral ground, as a speedway between Audubon and city parks, and Hagen Avenue was renamed the Parkway. Just a few years later, the street got yet another new name, not for automobiling this time, but for a different fad sweeping the nation. At the end of the 19th century, about the time the Supreme Court declared segregation legal in Plessy versus Ferguson, the United Daughters of the Confederacy and others launched a propaganda campaign to reframe the Civil War as a noble lost cause, a battle for states' rights that had nothing to do with slavery. Across the country, but especially in the South, monuments and statues were erected and streets and parks lost their original names, rechristened for rebel politicians and generals. The lost causers of New Orleans, perhaps embarrassed at the city's early surrender to the Union, embraced the rebranding wholeheartedly, with monuments to Lee and Beauregard. Even the white supremacists who tried to overthrow the city's reconstruction government in the infamous Liberty Place riot were given their own obelisk at the foot of Canal Street. In 1910, the city renamed the Parkway for Confederate President Jefferson Davis. The following year, a monument to Davis was unveiled where Canal Street meets the Parkway. The dedication ceremony in February 1911 was a grand whites-only affair with speeches and parading militias. Behind the statue of Davis, which stood shrouded in a Confederate battle flag, a choir of schoolchildren in red, white, and blue formed a living flag singing Dixie. In the years after the Davis Monument went up, a few more Confederates were honored in stone and bronze. But in New Orleans and around the country, the statuary craze died down as the century wore on. The statues of Beauregard and Lee became local landmarks and the subject of tourist postcards. But the Liberty Place Monument at the foot of Canal Street couldn't be normalized. It became a place of pilgrimage for white racists with a new explicitly supremacist plaque added in 1932. The civil rights protests of the 1960s targeted Canal Street's segregated businesses like Woolworths and the Lowe's Theater, but not its statues and monuments. Street repairs begun in 1989 removed the Liberty Place Monument but protests and a lawsuit backed by supremacists like former KKK Grand Wizard David Duke led to it being put back, without the 1932 plaque, behind a power station and hotel garage. For some New Orleanians and visitors, the city's lost cause monuments faded into the background, becoming just another part of the landscape. But while they may not have been as prominent as in years past, New Orleans Confederate monuments were still standing into the new century. Then came Charleston. When nine people were shot dead at the Emanuel AME Church by a 21-year-old white supremacist, cities throughout the country began looking at their Confederate monuments and street names in a new light. In New Orleans, the City Council and Landmarks Commission identified lost cause monuments to be removed, 
while a separate commission was formed to identify the many streets, squares, and parks named after Confederates and slaveholders. Opposition rose immediately, led by Governor Bobby Jindal and Republican members of the state legislature, who soon learned that they had no jurisdiction over the sites. Lawsuits were filed and litigated, refiled and appealed, and the battle over the monuments ground on for nearly two years. Finally, in the spring of 2017, accompanied by press, protesters, and police, the monuments began to fall. The Liberty Place Monument was the first to go, dismantled under heavy guard in the dead of night, followed swiftly by Jefferson Davis and Beauregard. Lastly, on May 19th, the city watched as a crane plucked Robert E. Lee from his perch high above St. Charles Avenue, while Mayor Mitch Landrieu gave what many agreed was a speech for the history books. This is not about a naive quest to solve all of our problems at once. This is, however, about showing the whole world that we as a city, that we as a people are able to acknowledge to understand, to reconcile, and more importantly, choose a better future for ourselves, making straight what has been crooked and making right what was wrong. History cannot be changed. It cannot be moved like a statue. What's done is done. The Civil War is over. The Confederacy lost. And we're better for it. For all the rancor and shouting leading up to New Orleans Confederate monuments removal, the aftermath was remarkably, blessedly quiet. The protesters went home and the symbols of division they fought over were gone, only empty stone pedestals remaining. One site, however, started a new life. About a week after the Davis statue was removed from Canal Street and the Parkway, a small metal sculpture of the word love appeared on the pedestal. The installation by an unknown artist began an ongoing series of unofficial exhibitions mounted at the site. Some pieces brought to the pedestal weren't serious. Early on, someone brought an old cat tree. Another, their cat's whole house. Some contributions were playful, some startling, some were downright goofy. On Mardi Gras 2021, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, Damon Melanson, big chief of the Young Seminole Hunters Mardi Gras Indian tribe, brought the suit that he couldn't wear to mask on the streets that year, along with a message of empowerment. That summer, members of the Level Artist Collective mounted their sculpture, Freedom Drum, an African drum upheld by standing figures. From bits of whimsy to earnest political messages, the old Jefferson Davis pedestal has become a place for expression, an ad hoc gallery created by the artists themselves, and a venue where all voices can be heard. And that is a legacy worth preserving. Thank you.